everyone. Thank you so much for coming. All right, everyone can hear me, right? Okay. Goodness. This is the Association for Spiritual Integrity, lessons from a young organization making a difference. And our presenters today will be Jack O'Keefe, Philip Goldberg, and Rich Archer. Rick Archer, excuse me. Jack O'Keefe is a theology graduate from the Pontificate University of Ireland, postgraduate studies in adult education. Working as an independent spiritual teacher for more than 15 years, she guides people in the unfoldment of their own spiritual journey. In her books, teachings, talks, and retreats, she supports the empowerment of individuals who are done with bypassing, done with hiding, done with outsourcing their spiritual awakening to gurus. Her books include Born to be Free and How to Be a Spiritual Rebel. Jack is a founding member of the Association for Spiritual Integrity, which is an organization with a mission to bring high levels of integrity to the culture of spiritual leadership. Philip Goldberg is an author, public speaker, mediation teacher, and interfaith minister whose numerous books include award-winning American, American Veda from Emerson and the Beatles to Yoga and Meditation, How Indian Spirituality Changed the West, Road Signs on the Spiritual Path, Living at the Heart of Paradox, The Life of of Yoganada, the story of the yogi who became the first modern guru in spiritual practice for crazy times, an advisor to the Museum of American Religion, and a board member of the Association for Spiritual Integrity. He also hosts the Spirit Matters podcast and leads tours to India. Rick Archer is the creator and host of the interview show, Buddha at the Gas Pump, since 2009, he has interviewed nearly 700 spiritually awakening people from the well-known to the unknown, from a variety of backgrounds and traditions. A former transcendental mediation teacher for, I'm oh, sorry, meditation teacher <laughs> for 25 years, Rick instructed hundreds of people and spent years on long meditation retreats. He has practiced meditation daily for over 54 years. He is also one of the founders of the Association for Spiritual Integrity and spoke regularly at the Science and Non-Duality Conference. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Diana. Welcome, everybody, whether you're here in physical form or on Zoom. I'm one of those non-lineage spiritual teachers who, as long as you have a website, you can teach. Okay. If you are an influencer, you can teach. There are no checks and balances. There are no ways of saying what your attainment is, what your skills are what your code of ethics are, if you are in touch with your body, if you are in touch with your own emotional well-being, there is no place for you to check within to see how you are doing in your humanness while you are an alternative spiritual teacher. Conference, use and abuse of power. I'd like to add misuse of power. Because this is where we find the need for the Association for Spiritual Integrity has arisen from. And to differentiate misuse from power, from abuse of power, misuse of power is almost always unintentional. It's nuanced, comes from lack of training, lack of awareness. If your shift in perspective on your own enlightenment process is such that you are maybe perhaps dissociated or you're hanging out in the zone of I am not my body and you haven't matured enough to bring your body back in to the fullness of your being. At those various stages of our spiritual evolution, if we teach too quickly, we will misuse power. It's inevitable. And so how do we create a space 
where we can fill the gap around what power is, how we can use it effectively, and how we can have our humanness present while we teach as spiritual leaders. So with that background from my personal perspective of how I see my growth area as a spiritual leader, I'm going to bring in Rick Archer to talk about the origin story of the Association for Spiritual Integrity. Thanks, Jack. Can everyone hear me? Am I on? Okay, good. Um, so as the moderator mentioned, um, I have been meditating a long time and been around spiritual scene, scenes and in touch with various spiritual people of various stripes for many decades. And um, well, I'll, I'll try to make this really short. So in uh, so, so that was one exposure. Then in 2009, I started this interview show, Buddha at the Gas Pump, and began interviewing people. And my experience of the spiritual community broadened tremendously. Um, and I, after a while, I began receiving feedback from people that one or another person I had interviewed was behaving rather egregiously in various ways, uh, sexual abuse, financial irresponsibility, uh, and so on. Um, and so I became more and more concerned with um, the issue of spiritual integrity. And at the uh, 2017 Science and Non-Duality Conference, I gave a talk on the ethics of enlightenment. I just posted a link to that in the chat. And Jack O'Keefe and others were in the audience. And afterwards, Jack and I and a few others had lunch together and conceived of the idea of founding this organization, the Association for Spiritual Integrity. And I think we, we all have very similar motivations for founding this, but perhaps also some individual differences. Um, in my case, I've always felt that spiritual development or the evolution of human consciousness is very fundamental and therefore very instrumental in changing the culture. Uh, it's it's pivotal. And that many of the dire problems that beset humanity would be diminished and perhaps even alleviated if we all operated from a much higher level of spiritual evolution. And obviously that we could go on for an hour defining what that means. And I felt that a lot of these misbehaving spiritual teachers were undermining that effort. And therefore, it wasn't just, uh, it didn't have implications just for the people they were mistreating, but for the whole human race. <laughs> and uh, so I just, I, I just became very much concerned with the, the issue of ethics in the spiritual community. And uh, we'll say more about it during the conversation, but that was my motivation in helping to get this started. And I think I'll leave it at that and let Phil say what he'd like to say. Thanks, Rick. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my background is similar to Rick's. In fact, we were on the same uh, teacher training course in 1970 when we were taught to uh, become meditation teachers. And so I've been involved in the world that we're calling here alternative spirituality for more than half a century, going back to when I lived a short walk from here and used to walk to across Harvard Yard into the uh, uh, Harvard Square into the meditation center on the other, uh, other end of things here. Um, back in the late 60s and early 70s. And then later on, my personal involvement with and my uh, interest in as a, a professional writer, which I became, um, this, I was especially interested in the teachings that came here from India through gurus and Westerners of various degrees of influence. Um, and the impact that had on the American spiritual landscape, which I think uh, 
in large way, in many ways, defines the alternative spirituality uh, dynamics. And at a certain point, I wrote a history of how all these teachings came here and the major influencers. And in that context, learned a lot about the um, abuse and misuse of power among spiritual authority figures, especially my interest at the time, back in the 60s and 70s, when uh, large numbers of people like me and Rick were uh, drawn to uh, spiritual authority figures and putting them on pedestals. And, um, and I, in my research, saw there was much more abuse than I realized back in the day. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm giving a talk tomorrow morning about that at nine o'clock, so I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Years later, uh, it, it kept being a source of great dismay when I saw that the lessons I thought had been learned uh, did not really uh, go as far as I thought they would. And abuses and misuses of power continued in the ongoing evolution of the alternative spiritual uh, sector. It used to, I would have been interested in what happened with the, the, the gurus and the elevated spirit and the uh, Buddhist teachers and all those uh, who came here from other cultures. But now it was happening with yoga teachers and independent spiritual teachers who are especially the ones who are self-anointed and lacking, as Jack mentioned, uh, the... the uh, accountability and oversight that an organization or a lineage might offer. Not that organizations and lineages are any guarantor of good behavior, as we all know, but at least there's some checks and balances. And um, so uh, this became an ongoing uh, concern of mine. And then when I heard about uh, ASI and what Jack and Rick had uh, created, I uh, attended a webinar where they were discussing their work, and I, I, I found it intriguing and appealing, and I made the mistake of making some comments and then was asked to help. <laughs> and so I did, and we uh, formulated our uh, code of ethics, which we'll share with you all. And then I was asked to join the board, and um, I said no. And and then they told me how much it pays. And <laughs> I said, well, since it pays nothing, then I'm in. And uh, <laughs> it, it, so I've been involved uh, ever since, helping to uh, grow and define ASI. Yeah, thanks, Phil. And so that brings us to the foundational pillar that our, myself and Rick and some other colleagues had spoken about first when we were having lunch in 2018. We need a code of ethics, some system of guidelines. So we did some research and we did some community consultation with our own members. And we came up with this code, which is available on our website and we have it in hard copy here, which is a set of guidelines. Now, it might seem like, oh, a code of ethics, sure, absolutely normal, and you tick it off and it all sounds great, you know, do no harm, of course, of course. However, one of our primary learnings is that, you know, our intention to do good needs to be supported by training, by information, by support systems. And without these within the broader community, Breaches of the code happen frequently without any awareness that we're breaching the code. So the intention is there. The belief that we keep to the code is there. However, violations of the code happen in these very discreet ways. So we discovered we need to bring in some system of accountability. And so, oh, goodness me, there it is on screen. Yeah. Um, 
we, we created a complaints system. We've learned more from what we've done than I ever thought possible. And that makes me celebrate the Association for Spiritual Integrity because the day I feel we got it right is the day that we'll be going back into the model of authoritative, authoritarian, hierarchical, whatever word works for you, that system of top down where the guru is deified is part of what accommodates the shadow and the misuse and the abuse of power within spiritual systems now and maybe always. And so we're learning as we go, modifying as we go. So we set up this complaint system whereby a student could write to us and outline what tenet of the code of ethics that their teacher might have signed up to, give us some evidence how it is broken. And so we have found that there is a huge body of work that can happen. I don't think it's our brief to do it, but there is a body of work that needs to happen to support students so that there is a more, more awareness among students around when projection happens, when, when you, you, you need to resolve something with a parent, but your teacher is fulfilling that role for you. All the psychological issues that can happen that create that power differential that's not healthy. Now, there will always be a, a, a power differential, of course. Any service that you go to, whether it's your doctor or your dentist, there is a power differential. However, within the ASI, we've started to notice that the power differential seems to be endemic and protected by when we bypass and use spiritual teachings to endorse and excuse anything you really don't want to face up to as a teacher. And so at the moment, our complaint system is a model whereby a student can speak about a teacher and it goes to a committee, a restorative committee that speaks to the student, that speaks mm. to the teacher, and that brings them together. However, we've had several complaints, but we've never actually had a full follow through on that model. There's never been a situation where student and teacher want to meet with a mediator or by themselves. It's never happened. So something is wrong with our model. Something is not hitting the mark. And this is how, how we, it has become the hallmark of how the ASI works. We try something and we're like, okay, we've made assumptions here. Let's backtrack. How can we meet the need? What is the genuine need here? And then we discover all the subtleties and the nuances of the power differential. We discovered that uh, teachers, for example, that, and, and of course, I'm a teacher too, so I'm, I'm uh, you know, it's a we thing here, that when there is a complaint made about us, the default ten tends to be to go to one of your own, maybe even a student who's now a teacher, who was a student of yours. And lo and behold, the shadow part of our personalities bleeds through our organization. And so the last person who can be objective about you is somebody you already know. Somebody that you've taught, that you have endorsed as a teacher, they will have the same shadow. And so we're noticing these layers and nuances that we need to address around the power differential, around shadow work. What structures do we need to put in place? What do we, do we have to some time down the road, look at or liaise with an organization who can talk about student, the student side of it, what happens for students. But that's not our brief. We, we all are at the board of the ASI spiritual leaders or influencers in some capacity. And so from ourselves, we want to do better. We want to change the system from within to make one small ripple that would address the needs that we have that are not already built in. We have needs. And any spiritual teacher who says, no, no, 
I have no needs at all. And I've heard a lot of that. I have no needs at all. You know, it's all taken care of by the divine. I see a red flag because sooner or later, as they evolve in their own spiritual evolution, their humanness must come back in. Would, would you like to pick up there, Phil? Because I could just keep going. I just want to uh, make clear that ASI is a membership organization for spiritual teachers and leaders and influencers, anybody in that kind of capacity, which would include academics, divinity school students, and the like. But um, it's... It is a membership organization. It's not, it, there's no dues or anything. It's all free. And so we would encourage everybody to uh, look at the website and see about the membership uh, criteria and uh, invite people who would like to, to be part of it. Because a big, as Jack indicated, uh, we're a work in progress. This is new. And so whatever we've learned, uh, you know, is, is, uh, in seed form, if we had this conference five years from now, we would have learned a great deal more uh, through experience. And we hope that as uh, ASI becomes a known entity and pe more people join, then uh, we'll be called upon to address things we hadn't even anticipated. And um, we'll learn from that. Rick, do you want to? Yeah, a couple of things. Um... For one, uh, we have about 500 members now, and we have about 16 organizational members. An, an organization can join. If Harvard Divinity School would like to join, hey, <laughs> we'll be fine with it. Um, and uh, I want to, people often get the impression when we first mention the ASI that we are, we have some kind of authority that we're going to be, you know, penalizing or revoking teachers right to teach or anything like that, which we don't. We're not the AMA or any kind of governing body. We, um, But we're just trying to raise awareness of the importance of ethical standards in the spiritual community. Because obviously, anyone at this conference, and we included our, you know, the spiritual community, what it's trying to do is very precious to us. And we don't like to see it um, spoiled. We don't like to see innocent, not, none of us like to see innocent, sincere seekers disillusioned uh, by some kind of mistreatment by a spiritual teacher. And um, one point I like to throw in is that everybody is a work in progress. You know, Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect. I'm not sure quite what he meant. I mean, St. Teresa of Avila said it appears that God himself is on the journey. So she might have been implying that even God is learning and growing. Um, I've never met a perfect person. If, if any of you have, I'd like to know about them. Um, so we're all capable of screwing up. We're all capable of... Padmasambhava, the great Buddhist sage, once said, um, although my awareness is as vast as the, as the sky, my attention to karma is as fine as a grain of barley flour. In other words, he was saying, yeah, I'm cosmic, but I could mess up, so I have to be very careful. And uh, so... I guess I'll just leave it at that, keep, keeping the comments short, but I just want to throw in those points. You guys want to pick it up? We're very open to a conversation. Um, Q&A is one model, but a conversation is more of our ilk. Um, and while we're waiting to see who would like to speak with us, I can talk about peer support. Oh, okay. Yes, please. I have questions, I, I I think if people want to speak oh, in the room, they should oh, go to the podium like we or take the mic. So the Hi, um, sorry for coming in late. So maybe it was answered before I joined. Uh, I'm coming from Israel. So my question is, is this organization just American based, just English language based, or is it open to other languages, um, people who don't speak English? I mean, I do, but not obviously. Not yeah, our, we operate through the language of English, but it's non-denominational and our membership is all over the world. Anybody else in the room want to say something before we open it up to the online world? And I, I just want to add that um, online or otherwise, 
let's all keep our comments or questions fairly short. No, um, no pontificating. Not that anyone has done that so far. So you're growing edges on <clears throat> how to, um, you know, bring the complaint of an individual to the attention of a teacher um, because you said that you tried to get them in the same room and it just never happens. Um, and, you know, with my work with the Unified Fitness Review Committee of the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ, we know that's not going to happen. So we've developed procedures for dealing with that reality. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'd love to know about the procedures you've come up with. Yes, that's, yeah, I, I would love to find out about that. Where we're oriented towards is creating a, a, a new normal of where it's safe for teachers to speak on a, on, in a human and vulnerable and open space so that our human evolution is recognized to be the perfection because it is evolving to pick up Rick's theme there of perfection. The perfection is that it is evolving continuously, but the divine perfection of that space within or wherever it is for us um, includes the imperfection of how we show up in manifestation. So can we create an environment of where it's safe for teachers to be vulnerable and open, where they can take off the role of being a teacher and be simply human. I thought, I, thought, I must own this piece, I thought, yes, I can hear lots of my colleagues saying, I have nobody to talk to, I have nobody to talk to. And so we are in the middle of our second pilot of peer support initiatives, creating small groups of four to six spiritual leaders in a lightly facilitated gathering to meet uh, every two weeks for eight meetings. Most of the groups want to continue. We're almost at the, the end of the second pilot. We have found that there are two strands. Many of them want, many of the groups are very comfortable talking about, well, how do I market? And do you have insurance? And we've discovered this whole practical realm of the absence of training, the absence of how, how do you manage? How do you do this? What, what, what venues really work well, you, well for you to teach in? So there is a business side. And then there are some of the groups have naturally gone into what we hoped the peer support initiative would be, which would be a safe space to be your vulnerable human self and let it all hang out. That's where the transformation happens for us. We might have to, you know, do more of the business training in order to create trust. Because I, I think, as yet, what our biggest obstacle is, is that we, we are seen to be unsafe because there is nothing like us out there. And if we're looking at this non-hierarchical model and we are looking at teachers wanting to do better, because that's what we are, we're from within our own sector wanting to do better, that model doesn't exist. And so looking at what are our needs and how do we create systems and structures that respond to our needs in the most sensitive and uh, authentic way possible, then we can make a real change because we're evolving our, our maturity as human beings. That's the part that, that uh, initiates or is the seed of a misuse of power. So we have a few layers there. You know, um, the peer support, the second pilot will be finished, I suppose, maybe during the summer. Uh, it's really interesting that most groups want to continue beyond the pilot. Um, we have about 45 people involved in this pilot, eight different groups, which is really encouraging. So we'll have a lot of data there around what does peer support for spiritual leadership look like? Can we find a good evolving model for peer support to satisfy that need there is no one that i can talk to that's a very real need how we get to spiritual leaders who believe it's unsafe i'm really not sure yet because that's about our own emotional well-being 
of just feeling unsafe in the world. And there is no place quite like non-duality to hide from that and to deny that. I'm not my body, I'm not my mind, I'm not my thoughts. And for me, without a connection to your own physical form, you cannot feel when you're out of integrity. You cannot. And so, so many teachers are teaching too soon. They've, they've had a shift in perspective, but they haven't gone in to their humanness or they didn't have the skills there in the first place because of not doing enough tidying up. Yes, lots of questions. Look, can, uh, I want to address some of that. A um, couple of things. First, with respect to the complaints uh, that initiated this, um, we have to acknowledge that our experience has been very limited so far. A lot of the complaints that we get are from very angry and wounded people, but sometimes they, they won't name the teacher involved, in which case we can't do anything, or they name the teacher and the teacher is not a member of the ASI. And so, you know, we can't even exercise whatever checks and balances are available to us. Sometimes they won't even name First, themselves because they're afraid of repercussions if, if they publicly criticize right. the teacher. Yeah. And, and so we, we have to acknowledge that um, with respect to the peer support system as well that Jack just described, the people who recognize that they can benefit from such a thing are not the people who are most likely to abuse and misuse their power. It's the people who don't think they need anything and are above all this and don't want to be held accountable that we have that usually cause the most problems. And there's not much we can do about that. But I think one of the critical issues before all of us, not just the ASI, but everybody in, who's concerned about the abuse of power and have therefore attended this conference is to educate spiritual seekers and students about what to look out for and what the warning signs are, how to protect yourself from being vulnerable to abuse of power, how to recognize it when it comes up. That's an educational process that's beyond what ASI is yet set up to do, but I think uh, in something we should all be working together in some way to, to uh, facilitate and, and make available to people. I think a lot of that has been done inadvertently because we know a lot more about these things than we did 40, 50 years ago. And so people are already are better educated. I mean, when I was chronicling, you know, abuses of power among the spiritual teachers on pedestals, um, there was no Me Too movement. There was nothing. So, you know, people are much better equipped now, but still these abuses continue. When we do get a complaint and it's about somebody who is a member, we do have procedures and those are works in pro progress that we're doing our best to be supportive of the people who feel abused at the same time being fair to the people they accuse and make sure you know the the, the accusations are uh, above board and you know it gets quite complicated but you know and that's one of the reasons we want to expand the membership so people can uh, contribute to the perfection or the ongoing, not perfection, it'll never be perfect, but the evolution of what we're trying to accomplish. There's a few questions and points that have come in in the chat. Um, someone asked us to mention the student guideline, guidelines. Uh, I just put a link to that there. Um, Angela Golat is asking about um, devotion to the spiritual teacher being essential in some you know, lineages, uh, the yoga parampara, direct knowledge transmission from teacher to student, and reporting and oversight processes are often complicated by conflict of interest, as well as willful hermetical ignorance in response to reports of harm by the guru. What kind of process do you sense uh, might address such complications? You guys want to answer that? Hey, I have given away my microphone, so let's see. <laughs> Go first. <laughs> 
I don't think we can address every cultural tradition um, or any specific cultural tradition. Leaders and teachers who want to do better, who we are. And so inviting leaders and teachers who want to do better to be part of this movement, to change the paradigm of spiritual leadership, great. Can we comment on, on traditions whereby adoration of the guru is, is a way forward? It would be personal opinion and it wouldn't be part of the, the ASI remit at all because um, those traditions have to find out if it's working for them. And are there ways that they can hold the value system and the, 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 the teaching, um, the important tenets of teaching in any tradition, can they uphold that without it giving rise to abuse of power? And that's for each organization. But as, as we create checks and balances, I, I know the butterfly effect is a thing. And so why not that it becomes a new normal for every spiritual tradition to really examine, to see what is a mask? What aspect of our teaching is a mask for abuse of power? And, and I would add to that, that I think, you know, we as ASI and everybody else as individuals, uh, that's a very important question. And um, I think we would all agree that a certain amount of respect and trust is important in a teacher-student relationship. Somebody knows more than I do. I, I want to learn from that person. I'm going to approach them with respect and a certain amount of trust, whether it's I want to learn how to play tennis or I want to, you know, know God. And so that's built in. But can you can you and have trust and respect without it becoming worship and blind obedience and without putting the person on a pedestal and assuming that person is somehow perfect and omniscient and all the other things we project onto spiritual leadership. I think that's an educational process. And many people do that perfectly well. People have teachers, gurus, you know, I've been to India many times, as many people with gurus show proper respect and regard, but they don't necessarily think they're perfect. Other people elevate them to that level, and that's where the difficulties come in. So, it, <laughs> I've just been waiting for a very long time. Yeah. So oh, this is online and the microphone's here, so I have some questions from here. Thomas, you can go ahead. Thank you for your patience. Diana, I think you may need to on um, okay. Oh, yeah. Who's who, what's happening? Thomas is trying to ask a question, but it seems like he doesn't have time because he's unmuted. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas, Thomas, are you there? Well, the, why don't you? Well, we're waiting for Thomas. Someone else had a question here. Um, why does the honor code not explicitly take a position on teachers having relationships with students when every other professional sphere has clear guidelines which don't allow them? We do have that, right? You guys want to elaborate? It's in there. Yeah, it's in there. We we talked ex exhaustively about that point, trying to arrive at something that would be reasonable and and uh, yeah, fair. I forget the exact wording, but it's in there. You'll find it. Thomas is ready now. So Thomas is ready. Unmute yourself, Thomas. <laughs> Still having trouble with Thomas. Let's get somebody in the room. Well, you, we've got too many people talking at once. I would people in the room to stand next to Jack and Philip when you speak so the Zoomers can see you. All right, we got a question from the room or a comment. So in the model that you've described for the organization, I'm wondering where 
you take into account that the students might have some psychological issues and therefore their feedback is, you know, comes out of their personal issues. Yes, um, it's certainly in the mix. Um, our, our response is with the teacher. Even when a student has psychological issues and is projecting and maybe making up stuff even, that's happened also. Um, there's always a little grain of truth somewhere. There's always something to be learned by the teacher, just something where they can become more skilled around maybe even noticing the psychological well-being of their students, of protecting, um, finding, finding that there is certain material that's appropriate for the psychological level of one student that would not be wise for another student. And so there's always some learning for the teacher. It's not about blame or that the teacher got it wrong or the student is, you know, shouldn't be with a spiritual teacher. It's more about let's let's kind of feel in to see what's the learning for everybody here because it's it's a it's a culture I suppose of growth and um, if we can find a way of relating and acknowledging and being totally brutally honest and find safety in in sharing and communicating in that way as spiritual leaders, I think a maturation will come for students and for us. I think we're in it together. We're supporting, at some level, we're supporting these blind spots that exist for both teachers and students. Um, I love this group. And what I love about ASI is it's like where the rubber meets the road and these real conversations, something that I want to bring to to the group. There's still this this discussion about teachers versus students, and I know that ASI wants to transform from within. But then there's so many people, like when I see you inviting the people here, like myself, I don't need or want to identify as a spiritual leader or teacher, and yet I know that there's a space for me um, because I show up, you know, often. So this is a challenge because we're challenging this hierarchical model, but still making this big distinction about teachers versus students. And then there's the great gray zone. And I want that gray zone to be included so that ASI can have a greater reach and impact. Um, someone named Deepa on the chat just asked the same question as Mariana just voiced. She said, is there a peer support group for students who have suffered from abuse of power from spiritual teachers? It is such an isolating experience. Where are the resources to get help? You are touching on all the points I have been reflecting on, but I don't know where I can find community with whom I can discuss these very subjects, heal, and learn together. Once in a blue moon, I find a YouTube video that helps, but no community. Yep. And, you know, we're not funded. We get random donations. We, we're, we're doing this on our spare time because we all have full-time jobs. Um, and, and we're doing what we can. And there is so much to be done. And yes, there is an absence of supportive communities. Sometimes I think that's a, a very important need. I don't know that ASI is equipped to provide it. Maybe 10 years from now when the foundation steps up and, and we have proper experts to mm -hmm. create such a thing, but somebody should. And, uh, you know, I hope somebody does, you know, that's a terribly important process. And there'll always be teachers and students. I mean, my God, that's just how things are. Like I said before, if I want to take tennis lessons, I'm going to find a teacher. There's people who know things and people who want to learn things. But it doesn't have to be just because it's in the spiritual domain it, that it has to, that devotion and trust and respect has to uh, escalate into giving up one's will or one's agency and one's power. That is, you know, where things get dicey. And, and I, you know, I, and there are lynch traditions that encourage that. You have surrender to your guru and, uh, you know, 
love and devotion to the guru is the a portal to divine love. But, you know, people have to be educated that there are ways to do that without giving up your own personal uh, uh, power and agency. I had Ricardo be in touch with you because I somewhat understand some of this. I had a long term, I had a long term um, connection essentially with Bhagwan Wanshnish, and I helped a good friend of mine reintroduce herself back into society after she had been seriously injured by being raped by L. Ron Hubbard. At any rate, my own things, I went to the Divinity School, but I also went to the Harvard Business School. And if I can be of any help to you guys. I'd be glad to do that. <laughs> Thank you. One initiative that I just want to mention briefly is that be, uh, what, what, one of the things that guides us forward is what's the need that's not being met, which gives rise to a teacher misusing power. And we've discovered that, yeah, the code of ethics is not actually understood. It means upping your game for members and and you know it 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 is uh, ticked off as as though it's just a checklist have you had your covid test it's almost like that without thought it's being ticked off um and so what we want to introduce is is uh, informative videos and it, it's funny because the sexual consent question has come up there twice and i would like us to put some you know thought into having this is what this tenet of the code means. This is what it's asking of you. And in this way, we're, I suppose, introducing training to spiritual teachers. And we do live in a culture where, where do I get training? How, how, uh, how, where do I get support? So responding to the needs, identifying the needs, responding to the needs is guiding our way forward to fill the gap, you know? Did you, did you have your hands up? It gets very... Um... It gets very dicey and, and nuanced to, you know, you asked about, um, she asked about um, the student's own personal issues, psychological issues entering into the complaint process. Well, we, in our own limited way, have already seen it, and I've seen it over the decades I've been involved in this space of, um, people making accusations and then when you 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 dig into it it's like it gets very nuanced and very complicated we've had people say um this teacher violated this number this and number that of the code but we can't get them to explain exactly how that happened you know and it it it's a, a delicate hmm balance we're trying to take in being in having our own integrity as <laughs> as the uh as an organization jack and phil i'm thinking it would be really cool if we had a follow-up to this talk on uh, through through an asi meeting so because a lot of interesting comments are being posted in the chat which we don't have time to raise and if those who feel passionate about this were to join the asi we could have a follow-up meeting and publicize it to all of our members and then have a, 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 a an at-length discussion about a lot of these points, even a series of discussions. Yeah, let's do that. We have an open webinar for members and friends um, every six weeks or so. Um, and so go to the website and register and let's make the next one a follow-up to this. Yeah. The, the amount of spiritual bypassing is, is quite extraordinary. Um, and I suppose that's kind of a note to all of us, is how, how do we manage the, that phenomenal world lens of perception with that other lens of perception inside that has a, a, another wisdom? How do, we, how do we do the fully divine and fully human at the same time and honor both? Without, without one superseding the other, without one being of higher value. Um, and the, you know, the lack of maturity that happens when somebody is teaching too early, that's 
what we tend to do is we tend to, you know, our default mode network, our neural biology has taken a shift. And so the, the separation lens of perception is not so active. And it's very easy then to add in the chemicals of power where your cortisol goes down, where your dopamine goes up, where you're looking for reward. Together, you have at least misuse of power. Hmm. And, and we simply don't know enough about the neurobiology of power, of the, the, what happens when your default mode network, that self-referencing network becomes less dominant and, and you're not stabilized enough to actually bring in your humanness. You're teaching when you're from that non-dual lens, for example, you're teaching from there and you're dismissing the dual lens, which, which you know, happens in some teachings, but it's not a way to live. It's not a way to live. It means you're, you're denying your humanity and the place of where we, we relate as separation. And can we wait as teachers? Can we wait to when we're able to, to be fully divine and fully human and honor and respect the human differences and not see everything as the student's ego, but actually bring our own self into the checks and balances and, and inquire into see what is really going on here. What are the nuances? Can I sit with this and see where is my part in this? Someone on the chat mentioned the psychological domain, d- dimension of the uh, teacher or leader who engages in abuse of power. And that's something I'd love to see research on. The, there are a lot of people who act legitimately as spiritual leaders, whether they're you know, ordained in some traditional uh, organizational religion or are self-appointed or had proper training by a, a teacher of one kind or another. And it's intoxicating to be a spiritual teacher and to have people look up to you and people come to you for guidance on the most important facets of their lives. And if that turns, goes up another notch and people seem to adore you and people seem to uh, elevate you as some special person, blessed by God or of, of who has achieved a certain level of uh, spiritual awakening or enlightenment, that's even more toxicating, intoxicating. And if you're a, a, a young man and some of those people are women, it's even more intoxicating and things happen. And then you want to be uh, more successful and you want to earn a living at it. And then the potential for not just sexual abuse, but financial abuse enters into it. And then you may have improper training or uh, inadequate training. And then unintentionally, as Jack said, misuse power by mistreating people in the name of helping them grow and all those kinds of uh, abuses we've seen with just what would look like just cruelty being justified in the name of, you know, busting the student's ego or, you know, disciplining them or, or whatever. So the, who becomes a spiritual teacher of some success and has students and can handle it with humility and grace and dignity? And those who get intoxicated by the, 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 the privileges and the, uh, the uh, dynamics that es- elevate your ego and th- then are vulnerable to abuse. What is the difference there and what could be done about it is you know, something that I think is an ongoing concern. It is ego. Yes, it's ego, but who can they be recognized? <laughs> Mom and I had an issue with being intoxicated by microphone. Um, <clears throat> so I just said, um, 
the issue is ego. But as you're talking, I was thinking, gee, did Ramana have problems with being intoxicated by power? Uh, I don't think. So then the question becomes, how do you determine what a true teacher is? I, I, you don't want to answer that one? <laughs> I don't think I don't think there are any perfect teachers, Ramana Maharshi, nor anybody. When I see the amount of editing that's happened to what he actually said, yeah. Uh, so, I, so I think we're all there. And I think that's part of the culture is that so-and-so is perfect. There's the model. There is no such thing. It, from what I've noticed, there is no such thing. Our humanness has to evolve. It has to be continually evolving. But what we want to see, you know, it might be locked into this hierarchical model of deifying a teacher. And therein lies the issue. Oh, Sorry, running. can I take my microphone? Is it working now? Yes, is this Thomas? Yeah, it we is have Thomas. About two minutes yeah. left. Sure. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you very much. Really interesting discussion. Um, I put in the chat, I, I've set up a mediation service dealing with intrafaith and interfaith disputes, which has kept me busy ever since I did my PhD on it. There's a lot of conflict between religions and within religions about power dynamics and so on. So I think some of what I found there might be useful for what you're trying to do. There's an overlap. And I'd certainly support this idea of another meeting. I'd be happy to join this group. Um, I wanted to ask one, one final point. We're talking about abuse of power. Is there such a thing as right use of power? We don't even have a word for it. We have abuse, sexual abuse, political abuse. What, what's the right use of power? I'd, I'd like us to think about that. And, you know, instead of just pointing the blame at spirituality and spiritual teachers, there's an awful lot of abuse goes on in academia, in the scientific community, and in the political community. It's, it's a problem across the board for human beings. If you've not seen that great movie on Netflix, Chimp Empire, watch it. You know, we have this... this biological inheritance of chimp rivalry, which I see again and again, you can see it between Putin and Zelensky. You know, <laughs> to me, spirituality should be about transmuting and, and sublimating and rising above that, that stuff. So what you're doing is really important. And um, anything I've learned, I'm happy to share with you guys. Keep it up. Uh, I hope you'll be in touch with us uh, and so we can take you up on that we're coming to the end of our hour um just just to differentiate yes there is a right use of power and training is required um there is a misuse of power which is what happens in most cases and then there is abuse of power which is the egregious sometimes deliberate um just to just to say it's a broader spectrum we're we're at the time dan do we need to wrap up I think we got it. Is it to 12 Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to have a closing word just as No, I, I thought I just I thought we went till uh, for another half hour. So I wanted I'll I'll be the first to thank everybody who attended in person and online. And uh I hope we uh hear from you. Please go to our website. Spiritual-integrity.org. All right. Thank you guys so much for presenting. It was awesome. And I'm really hoping for the best for the ASI. It seems like it's going to serve a vital role in spiritual communities going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us here.